Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship Him with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name, for the Lord is good. His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. As Psalm 100, let us bow our heads in prayer as we begin with the message this morning. Father God, I thank you for your faithfulness. You are good. Help us to be filled with the joy of your salvation for us. Filled with your grace and your mercy. Be filled with your spirit and a willingness and a desire to live for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, we've been talking about the will of God. And we've been met talking about how to live for him and how do we do this? How do we determine the will of God? And if you're thinking about our, our life and thinking of being 16 or 17 years old, people ask you, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do next year or whatever? And, and it's like, you know, it's, it's such a big question. It's like, well, I'm seeking the will of God. And there are people who seek the will of God and they go into a major in college and, you know, the, and by the next time, a year later, they've already switched majors. What happened to the will of God? Well, I just, I don't know what happened. I must have gotten it wrong. They want to know what the will of God like that. Like there's only one single path. I've got to nail it just right or else I screw up my life. And we realize that it's, we make it too complicated. We try to make it as a... You know, it's a bullseye, it's a one-shot deal, rather than recognizing that it's a daily desire to live the will of God, to know it, to study it, to understand it, and to live it. And then those special occasions that come become easier to determine what I should be doing, because every day I am to live for God. Not just to try to reach something so I can achieve some goal for God. The goal is to live every day for Him. Did you know that in a study of 200,000 ostriches, not one buried its head in the sand? You know that? And what does that have to do with anything? Well, you know the saying, you don't bury your head in the sand or something like that? Well, they, well that comes from one of the, they think some Roman historian, observer, and so scientist type of person way, way, way back. And, uh, well, um, they just assumed that they buried their head in the sand. Well, no, they, they don't. Ostriches don't bury their head in the sand, even though that's where that statement comes from. And it's still like, well, don't bury your head in the sand, like an ostrich, right? No, ostriches don't do that. Another animal, rats. <clears throat> Probably our favorite, right? I know some of you sometimes have pets of those, but I don't know why you do. It's just my personal opinion. But rats multiply so quickly that in ideal conditions, two rats, a mom and a dad, a female and a female, could have over a million descendants in less than 18 months. That's... That's pretty rapid, isn't it? Yes, it is. And you wonder why it's hard to get rid of them sometimes. And you also know that a shrimp's heart and stomach is in its head? Did you know that? Yeah, it's in its head. It's not like down in the torso of the body, so to speak. It's, it's in the head. Did you also know that this, these three pieces of information I gave you were rather pointless information? I mean, they're cool. I mean, they are, but what's the big deal? They're kind of, okay, that's nice. You know, my life certainly wasn't uh, impacted, really, by understanding these things. Yet, some of us, I know, will repeat this, one of these things, or all three of them, or two of them, to someone else this week. And we're going to do it. Why? Because we were listening. And listening is always a key to any relationship. We must listen to God if we want to do the will of God, particularly in those special, unique occasions. We need to be listening every day. To live for God every day means, as we have studied and looked, and go back to the other messages on YouTube, we have them recorded. Go back and, and deny myself. That's, that's the same thing. To live for God every day means to deny myself. It means to carry my cross because I've crucified, what? My old self. It means to not gratify the desires of the flesh because it has been crucified. That's why I carry my cross. To walk, it means to walk with the Holy Spirit. 
and step in and keep in step with the Holy Spirit. It means to offer myself as a living sacrifice to God, no matter the task or where it's being done. I am to live for God every single day. It's not like, oh, I do it when I'm at church, or I, I do it when I'm at home. No, I do it when I'm at work. I do it when I'm with my friends. I do it when I'm traveling. I do it when I'm at the hospital. I do that when I'm at the nursing home. I do that when I'm in working in my yard or on a project or playing ball with the guys or whatever it is. I am always the child of a child of God. And I'm always to be desiring to deny myself, carry my cross, because I'm following Jesus. And when I fall short, which unfortunately I will, I admit, I do, I confess, I will fall short. Everyone does. There isn't a single one who's never, out of us, has ever totally lived up to God's standard. We cannot do it. I realize I do fall short, even as a believer in Christ. I fall short when I do. And I'm aware of it, usually I am. <laughs> I confess and repent. And God forgives. Because He is faithful. I can be unfaithful, but He is faithful. 1 John chapter 1. And also 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 through 18 or 19, something like that, I believe as well. So far this week, in this, I should say, in this study, we have looked at two such passages that summarize God's daily will for our lives, and so we can kind of get an idea of what it means to live for Him. They're great summary statements. They give a lot of things for us to be able to look, to um, understand and to work upon. Maybe take one at a time and get that down, and then add another one to it, and then add another to it. You slowly build on that if you want to. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 18, and Romans 12, 9 to 21. Two very, very good passages for that. You can look at 1 Corinthians 13 to work on love. What does that mean in character as well? It's another passage you could do. And there's others too, but those are Sermon on the Mount, another great one to look at. However, there are times when a unique opportunity, a decision, a situation, choice, whatever you want to call it, presents itself to us. It presents us. It's not part of the daily grind, if you will. It's not part of the daily walk with God, even though the, the daily walk certainly is part of it, but it's, it's, it's unique. It's like, whoa, I haven't had this before. It could be a job opportunity. It could be something with a relationship. It could be something with uh, a situation with a home. It could be a crisis type event. It could be, you know, I don't know, it, so many different options that it could be in our lives. And, and, you know, and something like maybe somebody's asking you to do something or to go somewhere or whatever, be a part of something, and you're like, okay, you know, and, and so you, you gotta, you've got to decide, you've got to make a decision. And it's like, okay, God, I want to do your will. And there's three different approaches or three different aspects or three different ways of looking at them and viewing them. We can view them as a radically light, they're radically life changing because it's a very significant, huge type of thing that God is asking us perhaps to do. Or maybe there's a unique short term adventure, we can view it as that as well. Or maybe we'll see it as painful and unpleasant. So let's take a look at these. I want to, to as we perceive these, and we'll look at three different individuals in the Old, in the old and New Testament who God actually approached them and how they handled seeking God's will. First off, you have Moses. God chose to speak to Moses through the burning bush in the desert. You say, well, that was really obvious. Well, yeah, it was very obvious, but look at Moses' reaction. We'll look at this in a moment. And God reveals his will for, for, for Moses, and his will was to leave where he was and to go and free the Israelites from slavery in Egypt because they were in bondage. And he reveals this to him, and Moses has a little bit of interaction with him, but then we pick it up in Exodus chapter 4. What we find here in Exodus chapter 4, verses 1 to 18, if you follow along in your Bibles, it would be good to do so. I invite you to do that. Being in verse 1, Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, he said. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. So he took it. Moses threw it on the ground and became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. As Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. 
And this said the Lord is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous that had become as white as snow. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak. And when he took it out, it was restored, like the rest of his flesh. Then the Lord said, if they do not believe you or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe the two signs or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, never in the past, nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute, who gives them sight or makes them blind. Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. But Moses said, Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Now, obviously, Moses goes. You know, we know that, obviously, and and history knows all about him. But he is resistant to the will of God, is he not? He is. He's resistant. He's putting up all these different questions and all these different, almost like excuses. He's not exactly using them excuses, but he's basically trying to, well, what if they don't believe me? Well, what if, they, well, what if I can't speak? And, you know, and so forth. And who am I going to say you are? He says that in chapter 3. Obviously he is. But think about what he's being asked to do. Sometimes the will of God, it's a, that God is leading us to do and so forth, we have this, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do because he's asking him to leave the quiet comfort of home and not return. In other words, he's going to be leaving what he's comfortable with, something he's lived with for a while, something where he's grown used to and comfortable and he can rely upon and so forth. It's routine, it's normal, it's, it's, there's no fear, there's no danger really. I mean, you know, there's the usual stuff. But he's used to that, and God is asking him to leave that and not return. He's asking him to face the fear of the unknown. What's it going to be like to return to Egypt? He's wanted for murder there. What's it going to be like who's king or pharaoh? What's it going to be like to lead the people? How is he going to lead the people? He doesn't know how to do that. I mean, he's kind of was trained in Egypt. You know, to be as a prince and so forth. But still, how is he going to do that? There's so many questions. And God listened to him. And he answered his questions. His final one, he said, what about Aaron? He's already on his way to meet you. Aaron will speak for you. Obeying God and doing his will may lead to a drastic life change. Talk about these very unique type of situations and so forth. Yes, like leaving what you're comfortable with. He may, may have you leave what you're comfortable with to do something that he's asking of you. He may ask you to face the fears of the unknown where we must trust God and not ourselves. And that scares us. Because when I'm trusting myself, it's because I'm comfortable. And so we can initially resist God's leading and appear confused about what he says. I don't know what his will is. I, I, just, I just don't understand. I want to seek it, but I don't know what it is. Because in our hearts, we know his will. We've got to know, many times we know where he's leading. We just may want him to ask someone else. So sometimes I'm not sure what God's will is. I'm confused. Sometimes that confusion is because of our resistance to doing what he is asking us to actually. Because what, by doing what he is, we're going to have to become uncomfortable and no longer be in control. That's what Moses faced. Sometimes God is asking us to do the hard thing. Because it is the good thing. And you don't know what incredible greatness is going to come out of it. Let's look at, look at Acts. If you turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road. This is verse 26. 
the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candid, that is the queen of, um, of Ethiopia. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay So an angel appears to Philip. Now that would be pretty cool, wouldn't it, have an angel appear to you? Actually, probably would be pretty scary, because most of the time in the Bible, when an angel appears to someone uh, in the vision, they, they're kind of, there's a little bit of fear, so it would probably be kind of scary to us. But regardless, he listens and he obeys to what the angel says. He goes to that road. Look at that's where he goes. Then the Holy Spirit spoke to him, and he listens and he obeys, and he does that. In other words, it's not life-altering here. This is not a life-altering mission. Perhaps it's more of an adventure. He's like, okay, yeah, that sounds really cool. I'll do that. It's intriguing. Because it, it fits in. Maybe he's excited about that and so forth. A key to knowing and obeying God's will is having ears that listen to what the Spirit is saying. In other words, if I'm used to every day reading in His Word, spending time in prayer, listening to Him, listening to what the Lord is saying through others, and maybe even giving a vision that God gives to us on a rare occasion or something like that, we're used to that. We're used to listening and so what happens when God speaks? Like, oh, cool. Here's something. Yeah, yeah, this is different. It's like, you know, I, for some reason I feel like I need to call someone. To, I don't know why, but you're right. You know, I should call him or her today. And so you do. Well, maybe I should stop in and visit them. And you do it, and you know what? It turns out incredible. You're right. Or you're somewhere, you're there, and you look at you're in a gas station, and someone happens walking, just like, I need to talk to that person. And you, know, you may know when you may not know, but you just do it. Okay, that's cool. I'll do it. Because you're used to listening to the Spirit. You recognize His voice. If I'm not spending time in His Word and listening to what God is saying, if I'm not spending time in prayer and listening to what He is saying, and I'm not spending time with other people, other believers, and listening to what the Lord may be saying to them, I'm not going to be used to His voice. When someone says, Hey, shh, did you hear that? I mean, that can be outdoors. It can be in the house. It can be in the room. It can be at your porch. It can be wherever in a group. Someone does that. Hey, no, I'm serious. Listen, what? What do we do? Mm -hmm. We zip it and we just kind of all of a sudden we be still, don't we? And somebody's rushing him. Hey, stop that! Did you hear that? Listen, listen. Did you hear this? You hear that noise? We stop. And we be still, don't we? Listen. Sometimes I'm not sure if God's will because I'm too busy. And therefore I'm distracted. I don't take time on a daily basis to be with God. And if I'm not taking time on a daily basis to be with Him, how am I going to recognize His voice? Because if I'm too busy, guess what? I'm going to be distracted. I'm distracted because I'm running everywhere doing all this. That. I don't have time to be still. I don't have time to do that. But God teaches us we need to be still and know that He is God. And both of the passages we looked at, I said to be what? Patient. Which means to, long suffering, to wait upon who? The Lord. Why? So I can hear Him. What happens is if I'm distracted, I'm making noise. I'm like a squirrel out in the woods. If you're not sure what that's like, go out in the woods sometime and hear you hear like, oh my goodness, it's a big bear coming all that noise. You realize it's just a stupid squirrel. I shouldn't call it stupid, I guess. But anyway, it's just a squirrel. That's all it is. You're like, oh, you're kidding me, you know? Too busy. Therefore, we're distracted. We make noise. And when we're making noise, we may miss out on an intriguing adventure that the Lord has for us. But we're not listening. And so it goes to someone who is listening. I was like Luke chapter 22, verses 39 and 43. Jesus went out as, uh, as usual to the Mount of Olives. Now this is, of course, after the, the Last Supper, okay? And his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, Pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. 
Jesus faces, okay, and we're familiar with this, you know, we know this is leading up to, it's, it's just, you know, his crucifixion, his arrest, crucifixion, and then, of course, burial, and then resurrection, amen to that. But Jesus faces an unknown amount of pain and suffering at this point. He's like, yeah, but he's all-knowing. He's fully man, he's fully God, but he has not experienced death. He has not experienced this. I mean, think about it. A death by crucifixion? Does anybody here even, do we even have any idea ourselves what that's like? If you want, you can read descriptions about it, and they are brutal. The Romans have perfected it to maximize the amount of pain and, and length of pain. However, we don't know what it's like. We've never been through it. But maybe you say, well, yeah, well, I've had a nail go through my foot or something like that, so you kind of have an idea, and you've had some excruciating pain and so forth. So, okay, so maybe we can. Okay, so maybe you get a little bit of it. But carrying the sin of the world? I, none of us have any clue. None of us. I, I have no idea what that pain would be like. He talked about how he felt like he was being crushed. Soul was in anguish. So he expresses his anguish to his Heavenly Father, who is also my Heavenly Father, and your Heavenly Father. And he says, if this is possible, for this to be taken away, so he doesn't have to go through this. He can do it a different way. If it is possible for the Father to take this away from him, let's do it. But not my will, but yours be done, he prays. There's fear. He's got pain coming up. There's sorrow, but there is surrender. I will do this, and there, I will do this because this is your will. I know your will is, is better, even though, man, it looks, it looks at this point, it looks, oh, what I'm facing right now is so bad and horrible, it feels. I feel like I'm being crushed. But the result will be good, pleasing, and perfect because he steps out in faith. Sometimes we don't want to do what God is asking because it sounds too hard. Now God, I'm sorry, no, no, no way God asked me to do that. Where's our faith? As Jesus would say, ye of little faith, God's will is good. Please be perfect, isn't it? Jesus said before, man, I tell you, when he did this, he said, your will be done. Not, not, not mine, but your will be done. And then, we look at that and we realize that what an incredible, the most powerful example of love the world has ever seen is Christ laying down his life for us and then rising again from the dead. It's because of that we have life, we can be saved. What an incredibly awesome, yet horrible thing he did. He went through. He did and went through. It's just, wow. But we'll never know if we don't have faith. We have to be willing to surrender, denying myself, carrying my cross. There are three examples regarding non, the non-daily will of God, and the specific times and certainly opportunities, decisions, and choices that we're asked to make, um, sometimes once a week, maybe once a month, or sometimes maybe once a lifetime, depending on what it is. We can be reluctant, or we don't want to obey, we'll offer excuses, we may Stop, you know, we, now, we, we, we may not be still, and so therefore we are missing out on adventure because we're not listening. We cry out in anguish, but we don't want to because it's too hard. But like all three, we need to talk to and we need to listen to our Heavenly Father and we need to express how we feel. And, and despite our reluctance, despite our lack of listening, despite our you know, making too much noise, despite our fear of uh, the hardship, oh, I can't do that at all, I just, I, I just, I can't, I, the cringe and so forth. We need to pour it out. We need to pour it out to God, let Him know how we feel, but then step in faith, carrying my cross, denying myself, walking by the Spirit and saying, Your will be done. Moses went, Philip went, Jesus went. And all three resulted in the name of the Lord being praised and doing great work. Moses led a nation to freedom through whom our Savior was ultimately born.
Philip led an Ethiopian eunuch to salvation in Christ, who then went home very likely became the one who helped found the Ethiopian church that's still alive to this day. And then Jesus became the Savior of the world. When we go to God and talk to Him about our reluctance, or maybe even some excitement or whatever, we need to go to Him and our desires, we need to seek confirmation to one of the things we need to seek is, is confirmation of what the Lord is leading us to do and asking of us, because God always confirms. Through people, through His Word, through prayer, He is always going to confirm His stuff, because truth can always be confirmed. Lies cannot. The truth will be confirmed, and God always does that. So I encourage you to that, to be still, to listen, because the Lord our God is the one true living God. Be still before Him and listen. On every single day as you live out His daily will, practice listening to Him. And then when those unique situations of decisions, opportunities, and things come up, it's easier to seek the will of God because you're willing to listen to His voice. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, I'll admit, we as humans, we struggle more than we should <laughs> because we don't listen to you. And I know it sounds really, in a way, that our ears sometimes it may seem kind of like, oh wow, that, that was a simple thing to say. Just listen to God, it's no problem. But Lord, listening is not always our greatest skill. We get so distracted. Whether it's in our head because of our fears, because of our excuses, we really don't want to do it because we want someone else to do it. Or because of the, of the imagining of all the pain and the hardship and mad, just how horrible it's going to be. And so we're just because of the unknown. And so oof, as we have that noise going on. And, or we're just so darn busy in our schedules and our time. We just don't have time. We don't take time. And so, Lord, listening is a tough one for us. So I ask that you would help us to listen to you as you speak to us through your word. As you speak to us through prayer. As you speak to us through other and through circumstances as well. May we always be attuned to when you speak. Every day. Not once in a while. Not just, I can't, you know, once every, you know, oh, that's right, we've got to force the time to listen to God. Hey, God, God, speak to me. We should be ready every single day, all day long. So help us to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. So we can live your will recognize it and then live it. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, thank you and God bless.